Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 16th of June, and I got this as an early Father's Day present from my family. It's a replica of Michael Keaton's uh, back belt. And it's really cool to have a little magnet so I can attach my pens and remotes to it. And I guess I should start using this for all my presentations. I was gonna wear it, but it's too low down so you wouldn't even see it. Interesting side note, um, it also comes with a batarang that you can flip open. And apparently it's immature and disrespectful if when your kids come down, if you see them to quickly get this out, pretend to throw it, run at them while you're spinning it, clonk them on the head, bring it back and then pretend to catch it and say, take that penguin. Um, apparently not cool and is frowned on um, by your wife. Anyway, uh, as always, we have the chapters. So you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. Uh, new videos this week. So I dived into other clouds. Um, I also talk about Azure. Well, in this video, I focused on AWS and GCP and how we can defend those using Defender for Cloud. So what are those uh, cloud security posture management capabilities and more that we can do? So I dived into that. And then I created a video all about, can I trust the co-pilots that we see for all the different technologies today? Um, be it, we see it with Dynamics and Office and, and everything else. And by trust, I'm really focusing on, is it creating responses on my actual data? It's not just making things up. And what is it doing with my data? Obviously, you still want to validate uh, anything it ever returns, but I really focus on those two points. So on to what's new on the compute side. So there were some new virtual machine supported sizes for the Red Hat OpenShift. Remember the Azure Red Hat OpenShift is a jointly engineered and operated solution supported by Microsoft and Red Hat. The whole point of Red Hat OpenShift is it really builds on top of Kubernetes. But if we think about other things like image repositories and storage management and network and monitoring and DevOps, it brings all of that together. Azure VMware solutions stretch clusters now support CMK, so a customer managed key. Remember the whole point is we have this vSAN um, stretch cluster where the fault domains align with two of the availability zones in the subscription. The third availability zone hosts a witness node. So now I can achieve that even if I'm using a customer managed key. And also the Azure VMware solution is now available in North Switzerland. Azure Functions now has Azure Data Explorer binding, so that makes it really easy in a declarative manner to both um, connect and utilize those resources from my Azure Function, so I can read and write very easily. Also now there is a Redis trigger, so the trigger makes that serverless um, function actually fire off and do the work. So now with that integration, it could be the various different types of Red Redis data type. So that could be a pub sub channel, lists, streams, uh, key space notifications, key event notifications, and all of those things I can now use to trigger and run a function. Uh, Azure Virtual Desktop has custom image template support in preview. So the whole point of my Azure Virtual Desktop is it's built off of some image. So now I can create my own golden images that will be used for that Azure Virtual Desktop deployment. And the key nice thing here is that there are certain customizations we want just for Azure Virtual Desktop itself, think FS Logic and Teams optimizations and multimedia redirection and more. But I can then layer on my own customizations, be it a script, a configuration, an app installation, and it's using the Azure Image Builder service behind the scenes, which itself is built on top of Packer. So that's gonna make it very seamless and easy to create my own golden images that I wanna use for my Azure Virtual Desktop. Also, Azure Virtual Desktop has confidential VM support. So these are based on the AMD um, SEV SNP based confidential virtual machines, i.e. it's a whole VM encryption. It's not the Intel based SGX where it's a secure enclave and I have to modify my application to use it. It is just the whole virtual machine has that encryption. So I don't have to change anything about my code, but I get that isolation and protection even um, from things at the hypervisor level. 
They're enhancing the Azure Kubernetes Service Release Tracker. The whole point of this is there should be now specific page information for the node image uh, release tracking, which would now be separate from um, the overall AKS um, information. So they're decoupling those two things. Azure App Service um, now has .NET 8 um, support in preview. And I've mentioned this before, uh, but the NG ADS series virtual machines are in preview. So that's the whole powered by the AMD um, Radeon Pro V620 GPUs, the AMD Epic 7763 CPUs. The whole point here is it's really built about um, gaming. So it's purpose built for generating and streaming high quality graphics for interactive gaming experiences that I'm building on top of Azure. You can partition the GPU, so I can get a quarter of a GPU, a half a GPU, or a whole GPU um, for those. And then the HBV4 and the HX SKUs for high performance computing. These are East US only today. And they're basically the same in terms of the AMD Epic um, 9V33X CPU. It's got the 3D vCache, 400 gigabits per second NVIDIA InfiniBand, um, NVIDIA networking. The difference is the HX is optimized for high memory workloads. So it has, I think, 1400 gigabytes of memory, whereas the HBV4 has about half of that. Uh, I think it's, I can't remember what the exact, 688 gigabytes of memory. And they always have the same amount of memory. Doesn't matter how many virtual CPUs, they have a fixed amount of memory. And then I can get 24, 48, 96, or 144, 176, physical CPU options um, between those. So again, I pick depending on do I want that higher memory amount or not. On to the networking side, so Azure Front Door now has a seamless standard to premium upgrade downgrade. So I can go from standard to premium or premium to standard with no downtime. So obviously premium gives me things like the Microsoft Managed Rule Set, bot protection, private link connections, um, to the origins and more. And again, it is in either direction. I can also use this to go from classic to standard or premium. Again, it's zero downtime, but there's some more steps involved, depending on my configuration, use of custom domains, use of my own certificates. But it would also let me, that's not in either direction, that's for classic to um, standard or premium. And then Azure Front Door has managed identity in GA. So that's really useful. If I think about, it, I have my Azure front door resource and it needs to talk to a different Azure resource. And primarily here, we're talking about Azure Key Vault for its certificates. So rather than me having to maintain um, some other method to get to the Azure Key Vault and authenticate to access the certificates, the Azure front door just has its native identity because it's an Azure resource. And then it can use that to be given permissions on the Azure Key Vault and permissions to the certificates that it needs in order to function. On the storage side, so zone redundant storage managed disks are available in new regions, um, Japan, East, and Korea. And then Azure NetApp Files has AZ volume placement enhancement. And the enhancement is, hey, I've already got a volume. And what I can now say is populate existing volume. Now it's not letting me move volumes to particular AZs, but what it's gonna now do is essentially populate which AZ that volume is in. So previously I don't know, I didn't deploy it in an AZ specifically, but I can say, hey, tell me, so then I can use that information for other placement options of other resources to maybe get it in the same zone or additional ones I want in different zones. But now it will go back and tell me for existing volumes, hey, this is the actual zone it's in based on my subscription. On the database side, huge number of updates. Uh, PostgreSQL flexible 32 terabyte storage option has now gone GA. This is up from the old 16 terabyte limit. Also talked about these before. So there are the troubleshooting guides for PostgreSQL flexible. So this is things around, hey, high CPU usage, high memory consumption, high IOPS consumption, high usage of temporary files, auto vacuum disturbances, auto vacuum blockers, there's now guidance, there's charts and aggregated information to help me troubleshoot that. And also, I now have this query performance insights. 
So that's gonna give me detailed knowledge about how my query is performing against my database. So I can identify and then optimize slow running queries to improve the overall performance. Uh, Cosmos DB for PostgreSQL now has the PG vector extension. Remember that the Cosmos DB for Postgres is using the Citus extension. It lets me have that very high scale, that very high performance by enabling me to now distribute the database. And the PG vector is all about vector operations in my database. And vectors are really important when I think about machine learning. So if I wanna train a machine learning model, if I wanna build a machine learning model, I can now use a whole bunch of different functions that are there for the most common vector types operations. MySQL Flexible now has read replica, even if I have HA enabled in GA. So HA enabled means, hey, I can have a synchronous replication of my database to another instance in the same region, normally a different AZ, but it, it could be same AZ. But now I can also, even if I have that HA enabled, I can still have read replicas to other regions, up to 10 of them. That's really useful for distributing my read workloads, my analysis, my reporting. I can get that off of my primary database, but I also then could use it for disaster recovery. I could do a manual failover in those scenarios. Cosmos DB now has ingestion into Azure Data Explorer. So if I think about this, what I can now do is that change feed ability we have in Cosmos Database can be used to ingest data into my Azure Data Explorer. And once it's in Azure Data Explorer, I get all those fantastic Kusto abilities to query, to analyze the data. Also Cosmos DB Vercel integration. So Vercel are Vercel applications. It's really a very user-friendly, robust front-end cloud platform. I am creating web apps. And so with this, there's a Cosmos DB starter template in the Vercel marketplace that will utilize Cosmos DB at the back end and help me get up and running very, very quickly. Uh, MySQL has the Azure Data Studio extension in GA. Hey, that lets me connect to, query, develop MySQL hosted applications um, with Azure Data Studio. And then the MySQL online migration has gone GA. So this online migration is gonna be really, really useful. Let's say for example, I'm currently on the single server, which is not being maintained anymore in terms of new version support. Well, I can do an online migration to a flexible server. So it's gonna replicate the database while it's up and running. And there's only a tiny amount of downtime because once it's replicated the data and that's complete, I wanna stop transactions against that source database, the single server, wait for any pending transactions to replicate, complete the switch and I'm up and running again. So very, very minimal downtime interruption and helps me do that migration. Azure load testing quick starts now supports RPS. So RPS is requests per second. So the whole point of quick starts is well, Azure load testing ordinarily lets me do big load testing based on my JMeter scripts. Well, the quick starts say, hey, you don't have to bother writing the JMeter script. Come to me, tell me what endpoint you're trying to do, what test you're trying to do, and it will generate it for me. Now, ordinarily, we base it around a configured number of virtual users but this now lets me just use requests per second. So I can tell it, hey, what is my target load in terms of the request per second on some estimated response time? And it will just go and set that up for me. Also, we now have an Azure load testing auto stop capability. So what I can do is set a threshold. So it will automatically stop if the error percentage exceeds some certain threshold in a certain time window. And the whole point of this is I pay for Azure load testing based on the amount of work it's doing. If I've done something wrong, I've configured the wrong endpoint, whatever that might be. If I'm getting a huge number of errors. I don't wanna continue the test and continue paying for the thing. Hey, clearly I've done something wrong. Stop the test, let me correct it, and then we can run it again. Also, there are additional server-side monitors in place. 
So as part of running a load test, I can monitor certain things on the server side, like a huge number of Azure resources are supported for this. And that would then help me correlate what the test simulated use is seeing versus what the backend services are seeing and maybe see, well, where, where is the problem? Where is the throttle? Where is the bottleneck in that? And so just a huge number of additional um, server side monitoring options are now available. And alert resources are now visible in the portal. So ordinarily, if I create alerts, um, be it action groups or alert rules or alert processing rules, they're really hidden from me. I don't see them as regular resources. Well, now they're just gonna show up and I can jump straight in and start seeing them. Um, maybe it's easier to just see this one. So if I was to just quickly look at a resource group, what you're gonna see, well, you can see it straight away. So now I have things like, well, an alert processing rule as a first class resource. I have activity log alert rules. And the other ones will show up as well, depending on what I have. So now these are gonna show up just as those regular um, types of resource for me. And then I can jump in and modify them directly from that. Container Insights now has managed identity authentication and ARM64 node support. So managed identity authentication is really, really useful because now the monitoring agent uses the cluster's managed identity to go and send data to the Azure Monitor backend. I don't have to use the certificate-based authentication. Both system and user-assigned managed identities can be used there. And that's gonna be the default authentication method going forwards. And hey, ARM64, maybe you're, you're starting to leverage that. Um, Container Insights is gonna work with your ARM64 nodes as well. Azure Advisor now has Service Retirement Workbook. So it's gonna go and look at what I have and give me guidance on, hey, these things are actually retiring. So I guess while I've got the portal open, if we jump over to uh, Advisor, if I had any clue what the icon for that was, there we go. And if I go and look at my workbooks, you see this option for Service Retirement. So if you just go and open that up, you can say, hey, services with affected resources, it will show you where they are. And now it's telling me which resources I have, what is the retirement date. So now I could go and focus on those and make sure I don't run into some problem uh, further down the line. So uh, another nice little feature just to help to make sure I don't get myself in trouble. And finally, um, IT service management, ServiceNow Utah version is now supported in preview. So the IT service management connector is useful for things like action groups. So some alert has happened. I can talk to an ITSM from an action group to maybe go and create a ticket or update something. So ServiceNow Utah version is now supported as well. And that was it. As always, I hope this was useful. And again, if you do happen to get a, a batarang, please don't run around the house and, and bonk people on the head with it. Very, very disrespectful. Till next video, take care.